Welcome to the Reading Nook with Authors Alcove, where we dive into the creative minds of today's most compelling indie, sci-fi, and fantasy writers. I'm your host, Agnes Wolf, and today I have the distinct honor of in interviewing Ace. Ace, do you mind pronouncing your full name? It's uh, Parlier. Parlier. Yeah. Yes. So Ace Parlier, and he is a very patient, understanding man, as I, this is actually the second time I'm interviewing him on the exact same book. There's something that happened amiss with the first interview, not sure what happened, but he has been so understanding through it and willing to let me interview him a second time. So thank you very much, Ace, for that. Oh, thank you. I, I just like <laughs> it. I welcome the opportunity. So. Ace is a prolific science fiction writer of his most recent novel, Voided, which I believe is going to be a trilogy. He resides in Cincinnati, Ohio. He is also an artist as, excuse me, an author, poet, and musician. And those inspired his first two novels, which is the mystery suspense novel, The Front Man, and the coming of age tale, Sierra court blues but ace's creativity doesn't stop at the written word he is also a lead guitarist of the metal band chaos excuse me chaos ritual so welcome ace thank you thanks for having me before we start talking about your books can you just share a little bit about what got you into the writing world um well actually i i was making up stories and writing stuff down since i was a kid one of my um earliest stories about writing was uh, we had an assignment at school. We were supposed to write a book and we had some parameters we were supposed to follow, but I can't remember what they are now. But anyway, I paid attention to none of it and went ahead and wrote my own like horror sci-fi book. And this was in the third grade. So I've always been writing. And uh, when I got a little bit older, it was mainly about writing songs that uh, poetry and, and metal lyrics because i actually had a, i had a fantastic um english teacher in the seventh grade miss adams and uh she um actually put together or at least it clicked for me and probably didn't click for everybody else but it clicked for me that i was into iron maiden and she said you know the poem charge of the light brigade by tennyson is about the same battle that the trooper by iron maiden's about and it was like light bulb went off in my head and you know I was on the path from then on uh, with poetry and lyrics and yeah so I started I started seriously writing songs and uh how do you feel you, the background your background in music and poetry and writing um, songs influenced your approach to writing your novels I oh, I, I think when I, I decided to start writing longer stuff I think that it helped me most with outlining and knowing you know already knowing how to tell a story, a beginning, middle, end, you know, th three acts, what each one does, you know, because you, you do it in a much more abbreviated form in a poem or a song. So, you know, those basics are there. And then it took me a long time. I was um, 35. I started writing uh, Sierra Court Blues in about 2009, 2010. And, uh, yeah, so I, I was rolling up on 40 then before I decided to really seriously try to write a novel. I didn't think I was ready. I mean, I I had I knew I had that story to tell because, you know, it was mostly true, just changed the name to protect the guilty. But, you know, at the same time, you had to make it interesting. You had to streamline it. So I think between the two, that was the best project I probably could have started on and learned a lot, a lot, because it took me... It took me about four years to write the first, or about three years to write the first draft. So, yeah, it was, uh, I, I'm just happy to you that I stuck to it, that I stayed with it until I had it done. So, what caused you to switch to sci-fi? Oh, I, I love sci-fi. I'm a sci-fi fan from Go. My dad was a big sci-fi fan. So when we were kids, we always he always took us to the drive-in to see Planet of the Apes and, um, Star Wars. I mean, I saw Star Wars before I started kindergarten. So you've been a lifelong fan of Star Wars. And uh, yeah, all those, uh, the Black Hole and uh, there was a bunch of movies. A lot of my good memories with my dad or us going out, just the two of us to watch the sci-fi movies. 
and that was one of the reasons why I didn't try sci-fi first when uh, for my first novel, because I didn't want to mess it up, you know, and I didn't want it to be derivative. I think it served me better to wait a couple of novels and sharpen my skills before I took a crack at it. But the story come from the story itself come from a writing exercise that a friend of mine had. And I originally was just going to do like a long poem or a short story or something with it. And when I when I developed Nina, the the main character, I just after working with her, I was like, I got to do a whole novel. This is a really cool story, and you know it deserves like. Because I was actually messing with it while I was finishing the edits on the front man. So it was giving me something to do to distract myself from, you know, all the editing work that I was doing. And so I started on the novel before I got the third novel, before I got the second one finished. Awesome. Well, you actually sent me two copies of the sci-fi book Voided, which I will be giving to two of my listeners, as well as reading it myself, um, which I have started. Well, what could we expect from the book without trying to give any spoilers? Ooh, hmm, that's rough. Um, <laughs> I'd say it, it's it's about it's a book about redemption and, and um, character. Even if you made a lot of mistakes, it's a blessing in itself to find it in your heart to try to change, and, and it's a triumph for will to actually change and become a better person and so that's one of the storylines flowing through the book about the main character nina actually starts out being imprisoned i believe yes do you mind sharing um why she was imprisoned and what her redemption arc looks like oh uh, well yeah she was put in prison over a friendly fire incident she was fired on by a superior officer and she tried to avoid the firefight, but it, it got pretty heated and she ended up smoking it. instead of executing her because she was fired upon and there was witnesses. They, they give her life in prison. And so she's stuck in a space station in a prison, open to space and has spent the better part of a decade. So the story opens and Union Army is conscripting incarcerated pilots and civilian pilots because the war is going badly and they have sent Nina on uh, missions to retrieve war material, rare gas, rare material. And so she's already flown a bunch of successful missions. Well, then an admiral comes with a more dangerous mission and tells her, if you can survive this and fly this mission for me, I'll commute your sentence. She agrees without even having to think about it. She's like, I'd rather die than spend the rest of my life in this prison. So... That's how the book starts. And do you mind just explaining the world that she lives in? Oh, yeah. Um, and this was a lot of fun developing the world. It would be about the late 27th century. It's about 700 years ahead of us now. And there's a lot of little enclaves in this part of space. And the one that Earth is, belongs to is called, um, it's a trade union. It's a commerce union. And they actually um, service larger conglomerates out elsewhere in the galaxy. They weren't prepared for the war when it came to them because they weren't like a government. They were more like a union, a cooperative. And so they have to scramble to put together this army, and they've been fighting for a long, a very long time. So by the time that they come back to Nina, the war's been going on for about 20, 25 years, and it's starting to go really bad. It's not looking good for her. I believe she makes the uh, the agreement with Admiral Kirpik, or how yes. do you pronounce the name? Yeah, Kirpik. You got it. Yeah. Yep. And that's actually like a big part of the story. How did you decide to create that uneasy alliance and the moral conflict between the Admiral's um, I think it was just a solid examination of war. And, and one of the things that I put in the story that actually I carried over in real life was about the war in the Middle East and when you had all of the uh, refugees on the Mediterranean that were going down. And that really struck a chord with me. You know, as bad as it is on Earth, imagine that times a thousand, you know, that kind of displacement, you know, Trying to envision that, how that would work on such a grand scale when you're talking about 
30 or 40 member planets, you know, that are going through this and scrambling and their people are displaced. So yeah, building that world and how they got there. And that, that, that was a lot of fun. I, and it you know, was something that, like I said, I, I'm glad that I waited till I was older and, and, you know, had a couple of books under my belt before I decided to take it off. Are um, there any behind the scene details or anecdotes um, of Nina's or anybody else's that you wrote, but didn't end up making in the actual final draft? Well, yeah, with Nina, there was some stuff with her parents. There were like some flashback scenes because her dad was in, in government. So, you know, she was raised around ambassadors. So she, you know, she wasn't a stranger to politics. And that's one of the reasons, you know, being a soldier, the, the way her mind looks at war because, you know, her dad was such a peaceful man and, you know, she was brought up like that. And so, you know, the, the way she approaches it, her outlook on it is formed by her relationship with her father. And so I had some flashback scenes in there, but I, I, I think it slowed down the story down. So I took them out. And but there will probably be a lot more about their relationship in the next book. So, yeah, it'll probably start back at the beginning or near the beginning of Nina's journey. What do you expect to happen in the upcoming sequels? Well, Nina's at the end of it. I don't want to give too much away. Uh, the second part is about the end of the war and how everybody's displaced and scattered. Because that's actually going to be a na the name of the book. Is going to be voided, and uh, it's going to be called The Diaspora. Nina's trying to figure out that there was more going on during the war than she was aware, and that probably even Admiral Kirpik and uh, Captain Toll were aware of. And um, so she starts finding out about these things, and it uh, directly really relates to how she interacts with what's going on after the war. So there's a new adventure in there. Awesome. So you actually wrote two books before this. Can you just share, you know, they were the front man and the one escapes me. Could you share just the synopsis of those two books and what we can expect from them? Oh, sure. My first book is called Sierra Court Blues. It's a uh, Ramona Clay about my life growing up. It's about two best friends that grow up from teenagers playing guitar together. I mean, they spend the, you know, the majority of their time sitting together with their guitar on their lap, learning songs, writing songs, playing songs. So they grow up like that. So when they get out of high school, they actually get their first band together and it's starting to go really well, you know, within, within about a year, they're really starting to, you know, play bigger parties, starting to play at some of the you know, smaller clubs. And it's going really well for them. They're getting a really good buzz. And uh, things go wrong. You know, people's egos swell and, and it uh, all falls apart. Everybody's bubble gets busted. And so, you know, it's a coming of age tale. And uh, so that's that one. And then The Front Man is, it's like a, a suspense novel, thriller. Not really a murder mystery, but kind of a murder mystery. It's about like a, a really famous rock star like Mick jagger level famous rock star that dies under mysterious circumstances and everybody thinks it's you know it's an overdose but his best friend knows that you know he would never do that he would never kill himself he knows something's wrong so he starts investigating trying to figure out what happened well while he's doing that he meets um this mysterious woman that knew carrie the that's the rock star and uh, she come to tell him that she knew his death wasn't an accident. And he, she, she recruits him to help her steal Carrie's body and take it back home and solve the mystery of his death. So your repertoire is pretty wide. You write a little bit of everything. Yeah, I just challenged myself. Well, well like I said, Sierra Court Blues was personal. I lived, you know, 98% of that story. You know, there's bits made up to sh streamline things and, you know, make things easier. But so when I started my second book, I wanted to do something more complex. And so the front man has five different storylines going through it with five different sets of characters. And, you know, it turned out really well. It, it took me a while. It took me about, it took me about almost another three years to write it. 
And actually, it, it took me longer than that through the calendar because while I was working on that book, I lost my dad and I had been taking care of him while I was working on the book. That's one of the things about that book and, and about that winds up being about Carrie being gone is me reflecting on the nature of death and, you know, how you relate, you know, how you mourn, how you carry on, how you defend. So that, that's a lot that what goes on in the front man from his friend's perspective and because I was going through it at the time. So. That must be very powerful. Mm -hmm. As far as sci-fi, because you're a fan as well. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> for my fantasy and sci-fi fans, mm -hmm. what is a book that you would recommend for us to read if we're a huge fantasy or sci-fi fan that is not your own? That's a tough one. <laughs> I think it's funny to um, ask people this because it's surprising how many people struggle with it. I think I might have to delete this question. <laughs> I, I, I know. I'm a, I'm a, I've got like six, seven books flowing through my head right now. That's um, what they say. I think if somebody who's already dabbled in sci-fi but hasn't read a lot of the classics, I would say Stranger in a Strange Land. Okay. Do you know who it's uh, by? Robert Heinlein. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd love that book. For somebody that that's read a lot of sci-fi and wants something that'll really warp your mind, uh, I would say um, The Nova Express by William Burroughs. Or the ticket that exploded, either one. Um, there's a trilogy of those books. And those books are so far out on the edge. You know, it, it takes a pretty organized mind to get through those books because they are so outrageous. And uh, so that they're a challenge. You know, that's why I like recommending them. Well, thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. me today. Before you go, I did want to ask you one last question. What advice would you give to an aspiring writer who is just starting out in like a science fiction genre? I would say for sci-fi, I would say just write. You can approach it so many different ways with sci-fi. I mean, one of the things that I loved was the world building. And I mean, you could spend, you know, people, you know, written books about just that, you know, world building and fantasy and sci-fi. And it's a good, you know, and I think that is a good place to start is you, you, you know, make the rules for your world so you know what your rules are and, you know, and then once you stick with it, you know where you can break them in the story. And so I, I think that's a good place to start. And, and, you know, and it's a good thing to daydream about, you know, because you can do it at work. You can think about it when you're driving. You know, it's like, you know, what if this guy had a big spike in his head? You know, why why does that species have that spike in their head? You know, think about the characters, you know, think about the world, the, the how they interact. You think that's a pretty good place to start. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. I had a blast. Oh, good. And you yeah. had to do it twice. <laughs> well, hopefully this was better than the first one. I don't know. Well. I, I agree. I think it find it, we can compare them. <laughs> if I do, if I could find it, I don't know what I did with it. I got mm. to it. And I'm like, why can I not find it? And I have a feeling I know where what I did. But anyway, we all make mistakes. Um, and mm. I appreciate your understanding. Uh, oh yeah, I also want to thank my listeners. If you've been listening for a while, please rate this podcast. This allows not only my podcast to get before more listeners, but also my author's books like Aces to get before more readers. If you enjoyed this episode, you might also enjoy my conversation with sci-fi writer Richard Friesian. He's the author of Wet Wear Wizards. And again, I had the privilege of talking with Ace Parlier. He wrote the book Voided. Also, what were the other two books that you wrote? Uh, Sierra Court Blues and The Frontman. Yes. And you can find all of those links in the show notes. Thank you again, Ace. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us on this magical journey through Authors Alcove, The Reading Nook. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. And remember, this episode is brought to you by Noadays.com, a company that offers many courses from how to become a freelance writer to proofreading and editing. I have personally taken some of these courses, and I am very happy with what I learned. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, 
You can find the affiliate link in the show notes. I would love for you to join me on my other two podcasts as well, Authors Alcove, The Writing Corner, where we talk about everything writing, publishing, and marketing, as well as Authors Alcove, The Healing Corner, where authors share their books on healing and recovery. Until next time, keep reading, keep dreaming, and we'll see you in the next chapter.